G'day from Australia. I'm Harry Houdini and this is my second YouTube clip about scale modelling. Now if you didn't fall asleep in the first one, you may still be here for this one. And hopefully you may even subscribe to my fledgling channel. We'll see how we go. Now, last time I was reviewing the BT-7 uh, Russian tank from Zvezda and we will build that soon. However, I've got some projects I need to get out of the way and one of those is this SU-152 little tank destroyer. Well, little, it's huge. It was a monster. It won't even fit in any of my display cases. I've had to order a huge display case for it uh, just so that I've got somewhere to put it where it won't get covered in dust. Because in Australia we have lots of dust and kangaroos and wombats. Yeah. Enough of that another time. Anyhow, this kit is lovely. Here's the box. It's a monster, as you see, a great big 152 centimetre barrel, which would blow holes in anything. That, that's an Imperial is a six inch gun. I mean, that's what they have as secondary armament on battleships. I mean, huge. So, I have already built this, and I will put a slideshow at the end of this so you can see all the fumbling and um, finger gluing togethering and all the stumbling I did to get there, but it, um, it did get assembled and I had a lot of fun. Track links, individual. In my last video you heard about my bad back. Well this Russian tank is what gave me the bad back but anyhow that's because I'm old. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the weathering and I thought that would be nice for my second YouTube clip. And as I said I've already I've done the tracks and I've weathered them and I did them separately. I made the tracks up, glued them together but left one link broken um, which is a method I've seen done that I rather like and that way I could put them on and get this sag happening and then um, afterwards I could just break that link that wasn't really glued take them away, paint them and weather them and you might be able to see that if I put this up kind of close you'll see I've done a bit of weathering on those. I'll do more but it's already got a sort of a rusty sort of ness and, uh, and I've highlighted a few of the um, edges where it would have rubbed on the ground and all that sort of thing but there'll be more weathering to come now, what I'll do for the purpose of this clip is we'll just do some weathering on the turret, although I don't know whether you call it a turret, it doesn't rotate, it's fixed on this, it's just solid. But anyhow, what I did, I also left this separate so I could take it off and I can weather it all by itself. And that way, the weathering for this won't spill on anything else. And I do this also with the tools. Um, you may be able to see some tools there. Now, because I'm a bit ham-fisted and I'm not that steady uh, a painter. I do the tools off the vehicle. I paint them separately. And that way, you know, if I make a, a real mess of it, which invariably happens, it's only the tool I have to fix up. I don't know if that's even in focus. There you go. It's only the tool I have to fix up and I can play around with it until I get it just how I want. So I'll probably do... Um, some more on that when I do the um, BT-7. I'll show you how I do the tools on that. Although there's not a lot of tools, but I might do some research and see if I can't dig up some tools from other kit and put them on the BT-7 because I kind of like to do that. I added more on this, the um, the axe or pick. That was part of the, the uh, trumpet kit. But I thought we could do better and I added a shovel as well, which I know they use. And on the other side, I bought a photo etch kit for this. So I added the um, log saw because one of the things the um, Russians used to do is they would chop down trees and put the logs on the side of their tanks. Served two purposes. One, it was extra armour. So if anybody tried to lob a grenade or something at them, the log would get blown up and the armour on the tank would hardly get a scratch and the people inside, more importantly, wouldn't get snotted. But also they'd use the logs to get them out of the snow and mud because they could throw them down and they always had nice wide tracks and they'd get over them. Whereas the Germans were just sinking in the mud and being very German, they got a bit upset. Anyhow, more of that later. Now I've got a little figure in here. This was a Tamiya figure, um, or Tamiya, as some of you say. I'm going to say Tamiya because I'm Australian and I don't talk properly. Okay, so all of those who say, no, it's Tamiya, look, yeah, Tamiya, great. Tamiya for me. Alrighty, so... He's in there. I've already sort of painted and weathered him as best I could, but I might do some more with him later. But anyhow, let's do some weathering on this. Okay, here we go with the weathering. Now I'm going to use 
a few things here. I've got some enamel thinner, Tamiya, Tamiya, just because that's what was at my store, and I've got some panel line accent colour, which is basically just a wash that I'm going to use to bring out some details. I've got an old brush, but it's a big fat one, and I'm going to use that to basically apply the thinner on first, and then I've got an old brush, which is a little one, which I may use to sort of touch up and remove um, excess panel line. Now the trick as far as I've seen and in my own practice is to basically make sure you've got a clean surface and usually preferably gloss. Although I found if you use the Tamiya um, acrylic spray, which is very unusual properties and it's it's not the same as the stuff out of the jars, but the, the the spray such as this one, which is what I painted this with, okay, that's dark green. It's actually a, uh, a Japanese, I think. It's probably a Japanese army green, but it really looked the part, and it was close. And I knew once I'd wear that, it would all change anyway, so I, I chose that for this tank. Plus, there wasn't much choice at my hobby store, so that's what I went with for now. When you use that, although everyone else recommends you have a gloss surface so that when you do your... Um, your panel line and your and your weathering and your washes it'll all like go into the corners. I found the Tamiya spray almost does the same thing. So my method so far, and I could be wrong, but this is what's working for me, is give it that coat of the, the Tamiya base colour, which is close to what you want. Then you can go in and do your wash. Then after that we can do some dry brushing and we can do some chipping and some paint effects and all the rest of it. But we'll just do this for now. So We'll do just this section here because, well, that hasn't got much detail, has it? Well, let's do the back. Let's do there because then we'll be able to see some detail. We'll just do this back panel. Now, first off, you're going to need, and you probably should decant this into another jar. But because I've got nothing else on here, no other paint, I'm going to get away with this. First off, you need to coat the surface all over. In the thinner. Now the reason you do this is that will help the panel line wash. Um, it'll find its little crevices and it'll stay away from the base of the big flat areas and not only that you won't get tide marks. Okay now let me explain what all that is. If you just put this stuff on straight away you know, it'll darken a little area and it might run into the crevice, but then you'll also end up with this blotchy bit around it, which will make it look ugly. And you'll then have to go back and get rid of that, probably with some thinner, and, and you'll end up with a bit of mess. But if you cover that whole area first with the thinner, it makes your life a lot easier. Because now, if we get the panel line, on, just, we get this little washy thing, and so it comes with a nice little applicator, that's why I like this one all about ease. Now if we take this, just put a big streak on there, and we've only got to touch things like these rivets, and we can be a bit messy, it doesn't matter, because we've got that thinner on there to protect us. We can just pop on those, and there's also a line along there, I might do that as well. Okay, and then as here, and I might have a bit underneath, I'll definitely just slop it all in here. Okay. And then where else have I got some detail? Well, there's these sort of um, edges. As you can see, I am a wobbly painter. So any method that allows me to be sloppy and then come back and fix it up later, oh, well, then we're going to town. Now we'll just do around the edge of these hatches. What else we got? A little bit under here. Anywhere you think there would be shading. What we're doing is, this is not how it really is in real life, but we're accentuating what what you'd see and what you'd perceive. So in the real world you will see shadows around things and you'll you'll perceive um, the 3D depth of things due to the edges that are lit up and the edges that are shadow. Now in a model it's so small that those edges are quite tiny and, and under diffused normal interior lighting you simply won't get those hard edges, you're not out in the sun. So this trick accents those little edges and makes the parts and the little details pop out 
as though it was sitting in the sun, bright sun, at scale, and there were these little dark shadows everywhere. So it's a little trick of the light. So I don't know if you can see, that's gone on there and already that's making those little areas stand out. But it's messy. But that's okay. Messy's fine with this method because we're going to do some more. And you can see already it's pulled down here. We don't need that. So my brush that I had the thinner on, I can just sort of remove that for now. But we'll let that dry and with the magic of video we'll come back when that's dry and I'll show you how it looks and anywhere that's not to our liking we can touch it up really quickly. Due to the magic of television, here we are. Now this has dried. Okay, It's actually looking a lot better. It's already got a bit of detail starting to pop out of it but it's a bit exaggerated and a bit sort of... S there's a few smeary bits, you know. So, it's not going to be that hard to make this bit more realistic. And the beauty is, we haven't really got significant tide marks because we used the initial coat of thinner, and that allowed the um, the panel accent, or the, um, the wash, to go into all the crevices. And pretty well did most of the work for us, so already things are just starting to stand out. You know, if you compare that to, say... Oh, I don't know, here, it's all very flat there. You can't really see the rivets and the detail. They're there, but they sort of disappear. But with the back now, all of that detail is really starting to show because the black has sort of moved into all the little crevices and edges and it's making your eye think there's a big shadow there. Of course there isn't. It's a trick, just as I said before. We're trying to emulate what happens in real scale out in sunlight so that when you're inside at small scale with diffused light, it still gives the same sort of effect. Cheating, yes. Alright, so how do we fix this up? Well, that's not that hard. What do you need? You need a little bit of thinner and you need a brush you don't care about, an old one. So you get the thinner on your brush and you wipe off the excess so you've only got a tiny bit, and you have a look at where those marks are that you don't like. Okay, so there's a little bit too much happening here. And we take them off. Now, one other trick here is rain will streak up and down vertically, right? So if we remove things and then kind of go in vertical strokes, we'll be emulating natural rain weathering and washing and even grease and dirt and everything that ends up on this, it will still fall down. Gravity and rain and anything will work up and down. Um, in this case, if you're modelling other things like aeroplanes, well, there's a lot of other factors happening. But what I can do here is, very simply, I can sort of clean out some of these areas. And just with some vertical strokes, drag the um, wash where I want it to go. And you, you don't have to be perfect. In fact, randomness is what this is all about. Oops, we'll be putting that back on later, won't we? And you need to be careful of the fiddly bits. Anyhow, that actually now makes it easy to do this. And I'll just screw that bit of railing back on later. Alright, so I don't know if you can see what we're trying to achieve here. Can you see the effect? Or does it all just look like rubbish? But it does work, believe me. When this dries, I have removed sort of tiny tie marks. That sort of one there, I'll just... And when this dries, it will be look... Well, it will be look... I'm Australian, we don't talk properly. It will look very realistic. But you can fiddle and faff around with your brush with a tiny bit of thinner. You don't need much. You don't need enough to, to knock yourself out. But the beauty is, because you've put put it on there, it's going to linger in little places. And that's all you want. It's the subtlety you're after. Unless you want the thing to look you know, very heavily weathered. But I'm not after that effect. I'm just trying to get the details to pop out. And I want it to sort of look a little bit used and real. And this is what will do it. These, these washers are just great. 
I did my first few in acrylics. This is this is oil based this time. Obviously, my thinner I'm using is a enamel based thinner. Now, I did my T76 in acrylics, and that does work. But when you put acrylic thinner on acrylic paint, you know, strange things happen. <laughs> it tends to sort of wreck it. I think if I'd covered it with um, like the Americans like to use future. Well, actually, a lot of the Europeans do like to use future for wax. Here in Australia, it's called pledge. If you cover it with pledge, you can protect the underlying layer, and then you could run thinner over the top. But I didn't, so I ended up with this fabulous effect on my T76, where the thinner made everything dissolve and go brown, and I ended up with all these tide marks. I thought, oh no! Then as it started to dry, it looked really good, and I thought, oh, I hope it stays. But it dried even more, and ended up being very subtle. And quite accidentally, I ended up with a good effect. Now, if you want to see how that looks, there's a clip on you, my YouTube channel for the um, Tamiya T76. Anyhow, there's where we're at. And we'll come back when that dries and see if it starts to work. Okay. In this section, I accidentally hit the fast forward button on the iPad for a time sequence, so I'm sorry about that. But all I'm doing is putting on some streaking grime and in the next part, I'll explain how I smoothed that off and made it realistic. Now it's had a little bit of time to dry and I've already done one side. So over here, that's how we put this streaky stuff on. It was pretty dreadful, you know, it looks like there's a bloody oil slick happening there. And then over on this side, just like I did with the wash, I put a little bit of thinner on my brush and slowly feathered those streaks of grime until I got them down to what I wanted. And it may still be a little heavy, but I've kind of left that for the video because it'll show up a bit better. But already you will see, and hopefully it looks okay, I've got really grotty, grimy, greasy sort of marks falling down the side there from that hatch and through here and down onto the rivets and um, actually they're probably more like bolts. I don't know if they're rivets or bolts, but you know, they're little lumpy things down there which kind of attach the tank to the, uh, or the turret to the tank. Well, they've got marks on too. So look, you can see the effect I've been working up and down and it's given me even more pseudo-realism. And I really mean that because this isn't real. This is not how things are like in the world. This is more like an artist impression because... The real stains and everything probably be quite subtle. But again, out in the sunlight, when you're looking at things in the real world, they really stick out and they're obvious. In scale modelling, we have to accentuate things like that so that they become apparent. Otherwise, they're so subtle and so faint that we can't see them, especially inside, which is diffused light. Now, the difference between direct and infused light is direct light gives you shadows. Inside diffused light, especially from fluoros, bounces in every direction and shadows hardly exist because light's bouncing all over the place and it's into all the crevices. So, so our models look fabulous inside in our display cabinets. Then we put these shadow effects on to trick the eye into seeing more detail. Well, seeing the detail that's there, but it's really popping out. So there you go. This is what I'm doing. And I am griming and streaking and adding a bit of weathering to my tank. Now I'll continue on and I'll do the rest of that, but you don't need to hang around for that. If you've managed to make it all the way through to this point, well, well done. Excellent. Fabulous. Give yourself a gold star. I'll um, do another update to this when I've weathered the whole thing. And I'll uh, put a few photos on the end of this um, this video clip with a bit of snappy music to sort of let you toe-tap your way out as you exit. Alrighty, hooray for now. This is uh, Harry Houdini saying goodbye from Down Under.